Hello, St. Lukers, and welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's, the weekly podcast of St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Orlando, Florida, where we dig deep with scripture each week so that we can learn God's story in order to live in more connected community, love God in more passionate worship, and lead lives of more meaning and purpose. I'm Pastor Melissa, and I'm excited to be continuing in our series, 24 and More, St. Luke's on Purpose. In these four weeks, we're going to be exploring what we as a church in 2024 can learn from Scripture about what it means to be a church in the context we find ourselves in. Now, this week, we're going to be guided again by Dr. E.B. Arnold, who is inviting us to look at the church in Acts and God's vision for the church in Revelation and what those scriptures tell us about what it means to be a church living in more unity. Let's listen. Hello, friends. I'm E.B. Arnold of the Candler Foundry, a partner of St. Luke's UMC. Thank you for joining me again for this four-week series, On Earth as it is in Heaven, The Church in Revelation, and Acts of the Apostles. We're looking at the heavenly church in Revelation and then seeing in Acts what it might look like when that heavenly cosmic church manifests itself in real ways in the church here on earth. Our question for today is, what does unity look like? We'll be looking at Revelation chapter 5, 8 through 14, and Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Let's start with the church in Revelation. And after the Lamb had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand, They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. In the Revelation narrative, this mystical unity of the church is described in metaphoric terms. Bowls of smoldering incense are the image of the collective prayer of the church. Notice it doesn't say they're like individual coins in a box, but an ephemeral mist of aromatic rising smoke, an entity that gives off a fragrance. Then the elders and creatures in the story narrate the picture of the church that through Christ, saints from every tribe and language and people and nation are not random gatherings, but comprise the body of the risen one. It's not an afterthought. It was planned this way. Moreover, they are a kingdom of priests, ones who gather, sacrifice, and render it to God. And finally, all the creatures of the earth and heaven are united in their song, blessing the lamb from which they draw their strength. I love the fact that we're told they all speak different languages and yet form one song, one voice. Notice how this image of unity continues to come up. They are the smoke that comes off of the incense. They are a kingdom. They have a voice. All of these different, very different people from all over the world and throughout time all yet make this one body. It's a beautiful image of unity being diversity, but this single purpose of offering sacrifice to God, be it prayer, 
song. So now let's look at the church in Acts and see how does this unity um, actually play out when it's done by real people in real time and space. So we look at Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned houses or land sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This Acts narrative describes the nature of this early Christian community. They're emotionally, spiritually, and physically connected despite their diversity. Who they are as a community bears on their actions as individuals. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in his book, Life Together, we are members of a body, not only when we choose to be, but in our whole existence. Every member serves the whole body, either to its health or to its destruction. And so even when believers are not physically together, their actions both represent and impact the entire body of Christ. A person such as Barnabas, therefore, evaluates his property and means in light of his community's needs and goals. The image that Revelation painted of the saints being priests who gather sacrifice for the Lord is mirrored in Acts as the believing community also functions in a priestly fashion. People who move through life gathering resources, experiences, relationships to bring them all into fellowship with God and God's people. Interestingly, the text connects no one claiming ownership of anything with the apostles' testimony about Jesus. The unity of the church and the individual members' recognition of its unity by the willingness to sacrifice for the community is therefore a great testimony to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. One final thing. Notice how at the beginning it says, those who believed were of one heart and soul. And then later it says, there was not a needy person among them. Most scholars believe that, or I should at least say many scholars believe that that word believed is actually better understood as trusted. And what's interesting is here, it doesn't say who specifically. Now we are, I believe, meant to understand that we're talking about those who believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that he has been crucified and raised from the dead. But I do think it's interesting that it actually is unspecified. Those who trusted were of one heart and soul. And so I think that the trust that's being demonstrated in Jesus, in God's provision, is simultaneously a trust of all the rest of the believers, which is why we hear there was not a needy person among them. What would it look like in our communities if we saw this unity, this being one, as trusting each other? Does our relationship to a body of believers determine our actions and attitudes? If so, how? If no, why not? And what would need to change in our individual and corporate actions if, if we truly saw ourselves as this community of priests who are meant to gather and render sacrifice? Finally, are being connected and feeling connected the same thing? Why or why not? And what do you personally feel fosters connection the best? I hope that looking at these stories today together has given you uh, a new or at least a refreshed perspective on unity, uh, its nature and importance. And I hope these questions help you reflect throughout the week on what unity could look like in your context 
and in this great body of believers that we call the church. I'll see you next week. Dr. Eby has given us a lot to consider. How might her words and our texts from Acts and Revelation call us into living as community in a different way? And as you listened to this, what challenge do you hear individually to consider anew how being part of the St. Luke's community transforms the way you lead your life? I can't wait to hear how your conversations go in your Life Together groups this week as you wrestle with this question together. If you're not already part of the Life Together group or another small group, be sure to visit the St. Luke's website for more information about joining in so that you are living in community and exploring scripture with others. And of course, we'll see you Sunday as we share in the unity of community worship in song and story and prayer and giving together in love of the God who calls us into community. We'll see you then.